can actually just slide down. And in fact, where the glacier is pressing really hard, if you get ice and you really press it, it melts. Without adding heat, if you just add pressure to the ice, it will melt. And so underneath the glacier, you actually have a thin kind of layer of lubricating water, which is doing erosion, right? You've got water flowing underneath it, and is also kind of lubricating and allowing it to slide down the hill. So that's one thing it can do. It can just slide down the hill. The second thing is if you add enough weight to ice, it will internally deform. Just like shale, I was telling you, if you compress it enough, it starts to behave like Play-Doh. The Geology Department and a Geology Museum. Now the museum is no longer there, it's been moved, but the museum, the building itself is a museum. It's kind of recrystallized the quartz and to align themselves as well. So you're seeing active tectonism uh, going on during active tectonism, just to show you that this process, this first prolongs, it cools down. How does it cool down? It cools down by losing heat to the surrounding environment. And that process of losing heat to the surrounding environment cooks things in exactly the same way as if you heat up a rock, dig a trench, put the rock in there, put some clams in there and close it back up, it's gonna lose its heat to the surrounding environment, hopefully make you a nice dinner, right? In this case, it's lead that was remineralized, mobilized from the existing sediments and then emplaced just along the edge. So all of this lead mineralization, and it occurs all the ways along the batholith, up and down, but all of this lead mineralization and the copper mineralization, the zinc mineralization, all of these mineralizations occur just in the edge of that contact. And here you're gonna find it in the actual <laughs> granite itself, but hosted within these veins. Led to concentrations of minerals, and in particular, of copper, of zinc, and of lead. So if you were to go this way, you would hit the big, what has traditionally been the big copper mining area of, um, of Ireland. And in fact, produced copper actively until about the 1980s. Take off. One is that they're rolling. They're generally rounded, you can see that. That is the action of glaciers. So glaciers came through over the last about 1.7 through to roughly 10,000 years ago. There was a series of glaciations in Ireland, which covered almost everything. In fact, everything you see here would have been covered. Right? Within the Wicklow Mountains, that point there is the point of contact. So that's what we call an intrusive contact. It's one of four kinds of contacts. Contacts can be conformable, unconformable, they can be intrusive, or they can be tectonic, right? They can be along a fault. In this case, that's where the blob of granite actually stopped. That where well, you got to do some discovery and you were guaranteed to have a unique experience. So there you go. Thank you. That's unique. So, so the precise age isn't clear, but it's about 3000 BC, something like that. Look at that. This is a this is a man-made structure. This is a this is a symbolic tomb. So someone important would have been buried here. Think about the effort it takes to make this, right? And then this whole thing would have been mounted with earth again. So this is a, this is a monument to somebody. I don't know who, but somebody obviously. A, a serious I guess so. <laughs> eases them out. So you can see right here that the sandstone layers, the thicker layers, you can see how they're broken all over. And they've actually, some of them, if you fall them across, they're broken and they're completely pulled out of context of where they used to be. But even these other ones, you can see they're snapped and broken in a jagged way like this. Whereas we've got this big mass of, uh, of shale. That wouldn't have been originally that thick, right? So the shale has deformed as a result of depression. And right? so it's behaved in a ductile manner. Right? Whereas the sandstone is behaving brittly. So they're being subjected to the same, the same stress in this case. They're the same temperature because they're right next to each other, whatever temperature would be at depth. But they're behaving in very different ways because of the actual specific properties of the rocks themselves. The rock. Which transforms it from being just ice sliding along to the world's largest piece of sandpaper. And so as it goes cruising along here, it's going to sand everything it's touching like this. So now you've got this insanely high pressure water, which is being forced into cracks here. And then on the other side, where the pressure is released, because this is a, this is a rock, something which is standing in the way of the glacier coming down. So you're going to have ice melting, going into cracks, and then refreezing attached to the glacier. So then as the glacier goes along, it's going to take those frozen bits and just rip them physically out, which we call plucking. And so that's going to tell you a couple things. One, you see that, you know a glacier's been by. Right? It's a characteristic landform. But two, it's telling you the direction of travel. But importantly, that guy there, what was important about those Silurian things is they were the first vascular plants. 
So plants had begun learning the trick of taking water and pumping it through their bodies out to the tips, which is a trick you need if you want to get big. And the Devonian things get really interesting. In the marine realm, we hit the point of the world's greatest reef systems. The world has never seen reef systems like we saw in the Devonian. And they probably never will again. So the reefs are made of corals that don't exist anymore and these sponges that we call stromatoporoids. So tabular corals, stromatoporoids are making these big reefs. In the ocean, it is the age of fishes. What do we mean by the age of fishes? Uh, it's the maximum diversity of big groups of fishes. Today, almost all the fish you see are teleos. They're all one group. But in the, uh, in the Devonian, we had these strange armored jawless fishes. We had strange armored jawed fishes. We had early sharks swimming around. We had this whole diversity of groups of fishes. Up, are relatively shiny, so these are slightly metamorphosed as well. That's sketchy, but it's possible that's one right there. Hey, you know what that is? That's an, a nautiloid. Oh, there you go. There's a nautiloid for you guys. So this is in. This would have been. Uh, you guys know what an ammonite is? This is like a straight-shelled ammonite or a nautilus today. You know the nautilus? Yeah. Imagine you uncoiled a nautilus. That's one of those. And again, I only know that because I've seen a million of them, and then therefore I know what they can look like in oh, I think it's every possible period. So this is the Downpatrick Formation, and this is earliest Carboniferous. And as we start to move up, when we go over to the uh, the sea stack here, you're going to see it transitions kind of back and forth, and then eventually the top layer is a white limestone sitting on top, and that's the Moiny Formation. Now, if you notice how straight these guys are, yeah. and then if you look at where it's where it is over here, you can see there's a series of vertical cracks along the edge that correspond to the edges here and also some that just run right through the middle of it. So this is also exploiting natural fractures and joints within this rock itself. If this was perfectly homogeneous and non-fractured, you wouldn't see something like this forming. So again, this is an example of where, uh, where you know, topographic features are produced by a combination of erosional forces working with the underlying bedrock. So it's seen all of the metamorphic history that we've witnessed so far in uh, in Ireland. All of they also have a history that runs almost 500 million years deeper than everything really we've seen up to this point. Right? So these are old old rocks, and these rocks have had a very traumatic history. But really, what I really wanted you just to see is this beautiful banding right here. Because I haven't really had a chance to show you nice high-grade metamorphic. So here you go. Here's some nice. Yes, it is. Literally nice, and it's very nice. <laughs> As an aside, these are the rocks when we were at the uh, Caramore Megalithic Cemetery. Do you remember that the vast majority of the of the stones, both on top and the supporting ones, were made of a uh, of, of nice? This is where they're coming from. Not this outcrop, obviously necessarily, but the Ox Mountains right here. And they would have been carried in as glacial erratics, and then they would have utilized them because they're lying around everywhere. It works into the the twist. This, this is like the highlight day of the entire trip for me. Uh, so I started off, uh, before I went into geology and paleontology, I started off in the history and philosophy of, of, of science, and specifically history and philosophy of geology. That was my big passion. Uh, this is the epicenter of a major throwdown that took place in the 1800s geologically. So historically, this is amazing, but it's, there are four different kinds of contacts where two rocks can be touching each other. So you could have a blob of magma that works its way in. That's an intrusive contact. You can have a conformable contact where you have a sequence of rocks being laid down in order. You can have an unconformable contact where there's an erosional surface. Or you can have a tectonic or fault contact where they've been moved along a plane and they're juxtaposed like this. So what you are seeing in this rock here, can you see layering in there? Yes. Right? Those represent time going up like this. What you see when you look out here is the first kind of contact I was talking about, which is an intrusive contact. So the first rocks you can see, do you see how there's some uneven looking rocks? And then a little bit further back, there's these beautifully layered bedded rocks. Can you guys see that? Yep. Mm -hmm. The first rocks you see, which are clearly underneath the rocks that are bedded, 
are actually much younger than the rocks that are bedded. The bedded rocks are Jurassic. The ones underneath them are volcanic rocks that intruded into them in the Paleogene about 60 million years ago. So do you guys remember what the term was for uh, when magma breaks through in a fracture and intrudes in against bedding at some angle other than parallel bedding? Do you guys remember the term for this? We looked. That was a dike. What you're looking at is the yeah. counterpart of a dike, which is that you can cut across bedding, but you can also move in, separate bedding, and make a layer in between, which will be parallel to bedding, right? but which is unrelated to the original bedding. This case is horizontal. So it comes up, spreads it, and makes a sheet in between it. That's called a sill. So a dike is when it cuts across bedding. When it's more or less parallel to bedding, we call it a sill. Five separate units. So we call a blob of liquid rock that moves and then solidifies underground, we call that a, a pluton. So they were originally, uh, they were originally mudstones and siltstones. You can see this they kind of dark ridgy sticking up? Yeah. Okay, that's schist. On the right hand side are the granites that we stopped at at the very first stop this morning. Right? That's the, uh, the, the northern uh, pluton. On the left hand side of that is the granite that we were just sitting at before. We wrote it, a glacier will do exactly the same thing. And so you've got this mountain range over here which is blocking the path of the glacier and a glacier has jumped through this hole over here. The other thing to note is look at the topography in general. And you notice that most of the mountains around you have a rounded top. And that means the glacier's gone over top and then rounded them out. Some of them though, like the ones to the left, still have a jagged top on them. Now those ones would have stuck up above the glacier as it came along. And you can, if things go according to plan, I'm going to be able to show you examples of uh, erosional features that allow you to figure out which direction specifically the glaciers were going to reconstruct that bit of the history. And then in the front of it, it's jagged as if someone just ripped off the front. And that's exactly what's happened. As the glaciers moved away, it's literally grabbed it, frozen onto the rocks, and then just pulled the rock away with it. So this is telling you that the glacier is moving that direction towards this gap between the mountains and cruising out. That's what it's telling us. That's a good example. Then the side of this rock right here. Oh, wow. So these are all nices. The, the kind of current consensus on their history goes like this. Um, around 940 million years ago, they were deposited somewhere off the coast of Laurentia. Um, and they were originally sandstones, mudstones, etc. Then somewhere around 600 million years ago, they were buried, and they were buried down to a depth of somewhere around 45 kilometers. Uh, but as you're gonna see throughout the day, this is the wild, wild part of the wild Atlantic way. So the Beaumullet Peninsula, which will be on uh, the Mullet Peninsula, was voted the, uh, the best place in Ireland to go wild by the Irish Times <laughs> a while back. And you'll see the really, I mean, on the one hand, there's nothing here, uh, but on the other hand, there's everything here. Look at the countryside where you see these rock walls everywhere, delineating fields with livestock moving in between them. Uh, you're looking at a five and a half thousand year old iteration of the same thing. This is Yanks country, right? As we drive out, we're gonna drive by a beautiful lake. This is a, a that features actually prominently in some of Yeats's poems. This is, this is the countryside that you read through his poetry. This is what was really inspiring. Okay. Exactly these the right guys spot. here, both of these, and that's oh. the third one over there. You can see the ribbing on them. See? Cool. Yeah, they're very nice brachiopod fossils. As with many things, once you learn to see things, you suddenly see them everywhere. Look at this whole expanse of rocks just in the other side. All, 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 all here. Now you're never going to be able to unsee these things everywhere you look. <laughs> now the question is, are you going to be able to say them? Because <laughs> I still can. Roche Boutonnet, that's what we're doing. Not too gamey, no, 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 not too tough, no, it's so tender. Right, and we know this Jeep had like no teeth. Is that right? People don't normally teach you that, but I'm giving you the, the, the truth, the in-depth stuff, because you can handle it. Uh, you better not. How about you think I'm a geology now? This corner that we're driving more or less straight into a set of mountains. Don't worry, we're not literally driving straight into the mountains. We will in fact stop before we hit the mountains. Taking our pint with 360 degree views. Of Does it turn? I don't know that it turns. I don't know, it doesn't seem to be right now unless it's going very slowly. That would be a recipe. Yeah, I was going to say, it depends how many beers you've had. Yeah, 
Queen Victoria was coming through, and her ladies in waiting stopped and ah ooh ah at the uh, at the view. So it was good enough for royalty. It's good enough for you guys to take a few photographs. So the good news, guys, is that uh, you may have thought this is private property, but if you read this sign, it is in fact not private property, and no trespasses will be modified. Prosecuted. Someone has modified it helpfully. So don't worry. You're good. Uh, post suturization. That is not a real word, but I've just coined it. Right of. Uh, Fantastic. And there's nothing around that's learned the trick of eating. Right? So now what happens if your aquarium gets slimy? slimy? You put some sucker fish in there, you put one snail, and then shortly thereafter you have 10 million snails. <laughs> Everyone's made that mistake. Yeah. And they so go Michael is now going to be our guest guide for a few minutes to take us down to the outcrop and answer any possible questions you have. And I planted some really highly technical questions in the audience. <laughs> Michael is actually a glacial geologist. Right? So if you come up with the really, if you want to know about like, Igneous geochemistry, neither one of us is going to get it. I don't think These are for small O. Henry's. Uh, what would a fine grained dark igneous rock be called? Fine grained dark igneous rock. Real life. Here you go. The salt. Hey, 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 what about yeah. a coarse grain? <laughs> yeah, bro. Boom, boom. You guys are ripping Woo. through these questions. All right, does anyone know what? A linear intrusion like this, that, okay, here's bedding. This is a classic example of this. Bedding is horizontal. This was the seafloor. I'm walking around on the seafloor at one unit in time. I've now jumped forwards in time. Remember Stino's principles, right? Superposition, I've now jumped forwards in time. But at each point, I'm standing on the seafloor. So this is bedding, right? These are beds. This guy cuts perpendicular to bedding. If it cuts anything except horizontal to bedding, we have a term for it. Dike. Everyone just, no. just someone grab it. We got a dike. All right. Dike. Okay. Oh, dike. Catherine, I used to do this on the uh, on the Alaskan Highway, and I but I had a flock of two thousand of them. Here's a fun fact. You ready to have your mind blown? Okay. This is actually if this doesn't blow your mind, you're not thinking about it seriously enough. All right. <laughs> Okay. You are more closely related to a salmon than a salmon is to a shark. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Today, and do not put that on YouTube.